Greetings students, happy chapter number seven in human development. So let's wrap up that three part kind of triage that we do for every different learning or developing growth period. So we're talking about zero to two and we talked about physically what's happening with our little ones. We talked about cognitively what's happening. And right now we'll talk about psychosocial or the emotional psychological changes that are going on with our babies. So let's see here. All right, so zero to two. So emotionally, in a nutshell, babies are extremely emotional. In other words, everything that they feel, you will see on their face, right? As adults, you and I have learned to hide our emotions, right? We've learned not to react to situations. We've learned not to throw tantrums. We've learned to control our anger. All of that, babies have not been able to develop that yet. So when they feel tired, when they feel upset, when they feel angry because you say it's nap time and they're playing with their favorite toy, they, they have a meltdown highly emotional this is what babies do they're highly emotional we mentioned that one of the first um, emotions that they feel is that kind of pain because remember we talked about being in the delivery room and we talked about one of the things we want to hear in that delivery room is that big loud cry because we want to make sure our baby is breathing and crying and everything works and the reason that they're crying is because again we're having that transition of oxygen being introduced to their lungs for the first time and it hurts a little bit, right? So this is our babies, highly emotional creatures. If we look at this side, we're looking at a couple of different emotions, anger, sadness, fear. Our baby's gonna experience those at different times, right? But you can probably look at this slide and think of a movie in particular, the movie Inside Out, in which Riley really has these different emotions inside of her head, kind of going through what she is feeling. It's very accurate. So again, our toddlers, our little ones, um, anger and fear become less frequent as they get older, right? So we will start to see a reduction in temper tantrums and things of that nature. When we talk about um, emotions in general, the kind of last emotion to develop is what we call pride. And that's because again, it takes some sort of reasoning to understand what is pride? What do I have to be proud about? And so that's probably why it's, it is that kind of lost emotion that babies feel. So one of the experiences here that our zero to two year olds have is what we call stranger weariness. And stranger weariness pretty much means what it says. It means being weary when we encounter a stranger. And of course, you know, that baby is going to act a little frightened with someone they don't know, haven't seen before. And that baby is really feeding off of mom, dad, or guardian's reaction. So if you have your baby in a stroller and you're going down the street and you have an individual, again, a stranger, approach you and they approach you in an aggressive manner, um, and you, as the caregiver, you know, kind of stop and go backwards and react to that person, the baby then gets more frightened because they're, they're feeding off knowing you feel something's wrong. They should really feel like something's wrong, right? Separation anxiety is really important. Sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually a healthy thing. So separation anxiety means that your baby is gonna have anxiety when you leave, when they are separated from their guardian or caregiver, right? Um, so let's say that you've recently had a baby, it's three months down the road, and it's time for date night. It's time for you and your partner to go out, have a date without the baby. You're gonna leave the baby with the babysitter for the first time, that baby is gonna full on just cry because they've been attached to you. There's security in you. And so when they're left with someone, um, they're gonna have what we call separation anxiety. And we want that, we really do. We, you know, you don't want to leave your baby and they, they don't do anything because that says they're kind of, maybe there's something wrong with your relationship that's not healthy. Um, so we want separation anxiety. However, you know, by the time they're getting into be that late toddler, that three-year-old, you know, it should be phasing out. We really shouldn't be dealing with that anymore. All of us kind of want to pick up our babies and soothe them when they are crying. It's kind of the norm, right? So from research, we know 
that um, as parents, it's kind of the luck of the draw, what type of temperament your baby is born with. Um, so we've learned from the NYLS study that there's, you know, a few different temperaments here. Um, so a lot of parents will have a child and they'll say, oh my goodness, my baby is just so wonderful. They're so easy. I put them down, they go right to bed, they don't fast, they go with anyone. Um, they're so easy to feed, no problems. And so they said, you know, I'm going to have like 10 more because this one's so easy. And then they have their second child and they get the second one. They get a difficult temperament and they're like, what happened? This baby is so fussy. The baby never wants to go down. They will only go with me. They would cry within anybody else's arms. Oh my gosh, they're so difficult. I used to put my other baby down and she would just sit there and pick quietly. And this baby crawls all over. They're into everything and it's like a nightmare. That's a difficult baby, right? And then we have those that are kind of slow to warm up to, meaning they start off kind of difficult, but then they become a lot easier in time. And then those who we don't know what the heck they are, they're really hard to classify. <laughs> and um, so it is, it's like there's no reasoning or rhyme or reason why sometimes we have babies that are really kind of easy to manage and other times it's a challenge. All right, what's synchrony? So synchrony is kind of this coordination or interaction between baby and their main caregiver. So mom, dad, grandma, guardian, whoever that is, right? And so it's this kind of understanding of each other. You're understanding your facial features, your responses, your reactions, right? So when my kids were little, you know, they would understand me. They would know, oh, mom's giving me that look that says, stop what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at them and they're like, okay, I'm not supposed to do that, right? They can read me. We have this synchrony. I can look at my child and go, oh, okay, I know that they're ready for nap time. I just know it, right? So that's kind of a synchrony. It's this interaction that we have, unspoken language, if you will. So research has shown us that dads are good at a lot of things. And in particular, some of the things dads are good at is dads are actually more likely to make our babies laugh and they like to do a lot more playtime with babies than moms do, right? And there's a couple of reasons for it. I think some of it just has to do with some sex differences between males and females. So um, in general, you know, if you think about it, um, so let's say you have your mom who's a primary care caregiver or guardian for baby. Mom has got groceries to do, she's got dishes to do, so she spends the day with her baby. Maybe you guys are going to classes, you're doing different activities, right? Um, but you're busy, right? And with dad, what happens is dad's at work all day, dad comes home from work, dad gets baby and dad gets on the floor in the living room and they're, they're bouncing up and down and they're rolling around and he's playing with his baby and making his baby laugh and all of that where mom's over there taking care of business and getting things that we need to get done right. And so that's why, again, research really shows that dads are very good at playing with our babies and making our babies laugh. So we're going to learn about attachment, and this is really important. This is also a really crucial component or topic of what our case study is uh, coming up here. So attachment. Attachment is beyond synchrony. Attachment is this bond that you create with at least one adult caregiver. It cannot be with siblings. It must be with an adult. And it's this kind of bond that allows you to learn to trust the world. So it's this bond when someone takes care of you. So when I'm a mom and I have my baby, my job as a mom is to provide for their needs. So I am to feed my baby, change their diaper, right? make sure they're safe, secure, warm, healthy. Those are my jobs as a parent. Unfortunately, not all parents are great at that. Um, and so we don't always get that attention or love. Um, sometimes you have a guardian or parent that may change your diaper. Not always frequently. Um, they never pick you up. They don't hold you. They don't tell you that they love you. They don't sing to you. There's no emotional um, meeting your needs there. And that's not a healthy thing. Right? So attachment is when we've had a caregiver who does those things for us, who've done all the positive things that we need here. Right, so let's talk about why attachment is so important in life because you and I today are products of our attachment when we were babies. 
And so look here. So if we look at this slide, we're gonna see here that about 60% of us on average as adults, we had that secure attachment. We had a guardian who took care of us and loved us and told us they loved us and they met all of our needs. And so that led us to have a secure relationship. And so if we see here in the green, we see those of us in that 60% who had that guardian as children, we were able to leave our mom or dad or guardian, but we always wanted to be with them. In other words, when they left us at the babysitter, we had some separation anxiety because we like being with them. They're our number one love. However, we trusted that mom is coming back. She's leaving me with the babysitter, but I've learned to trust mom enough to know she's gonna come back for me. So I don't have to have anxiety about that, right? As adults, we tend to have really healthy relationships because we've learned good self-esteem. We've learned to trust and we've learned good self-esteem. Now, there's about 15% of us as adults who have this what we call avoidant type of attachment, meaning we didn't have a good healthy attachment. It means that as babies, we did not develop that connection with our caregiver. We avoided that, right? Um, so what happened that as adults, we grow up to be people who are very anxious, we're very clingy and fearful, and we're depressed, right? Because we didn't develop trust in someone as a child. And then we have about another 15% of us that are ambivalent. And what that means is our attachment as a baby was very uncertain, right? So when our, when our mom or dad left us with the babysitter, we were not sure if they're coming back for us. So we're anxious the whole time we're at the babysitter because we're like looking, going, I wonder, are they coming back? Are they coming back? I'm not sure, I don't trust it. So what happens is, as adults, we tend to be very dismissive, we're loners, we're angry. Our relationships are really rocky. They're not healthy. And then we have about 10% of us as adults who, unfortunately, were very unhappy children. Um, we were very clingy. We did not have that trust. We did not have that positive relationship with our guardian and as adults you know our relationships are very erratic meaning that you know we start them we break up with them we do all of that and we unfortunately develop these pathological behaviors they're very abusive relationships and so we really again see this 60 percent of us had this healthy attachment and about 40 percent of us didn't and for those of us who were in that didn't category not your fault it, it has to do with your caregivers who didn't do what they were supposed to do. It means that as adults, we grow up with issues. And although we have issues, I wanna to talk to you in this class that there's ways to overcome those issues. So if you were abused as a child, or if you had trauma as a child, or you just had a parent who didn't know how to parent, there's ways that we can deal with that, okay? I don't want you to think, oh man, too bad for me, that sucks right? Um, no, there's ways we'll talk about overcoming that. So the secure attachment, this is what we want. This is what 60% of us, you know, pretty much have as adults. That secure attachment, having a guardian or caregiver that met all of my needs, right? It means that when mom or dad or guardian drops me off at the babysitter, I have this like a little separation anxiety because I love mom or dad or guardian and I'm sad they're leaving me, but after a while, you know, five, 10 minutes, I kind of start going, hmm, I wonder what toys the babysitter has. I wonder what there is to play with here. And I start going to explore. And that willingness to explore means I am secure that my caregiver is coming back for me. And we want this. It's really healthy. It's really, as a parent, this is what you need to make sure to do for your child. All right, you can look at these in time, but here is really interesting research because this is why we know what attachment is and how important it is. It's because of this study. So back in the 1990s, there was this kind of situation that happened in the country of Romania where there were many babies or orphans available for adoption. And so what happened was the U.S., became very lenient or we opened up our adoption policy that made it very easy for American couples to go and adopt babies in Romania. 
And so this picture that you see here is an accurate picture. This is a real picture of what we saw in Romania. And basically it was like big warehouses full of babies. So there would be cribs stacked up just like this. And there would be a caregiver or a person, a nurse or a staff member that would start at one end and she would go through all the cribs and give you a bottle, change your diaper, bottle, diaper, bottle, diaper, bottle, diaper. And then she'd start all over again, right? But there was no picking you up and hugging you and loving you and singing to you. And, and there was none of that, you know, kind of lovey thing, that emotional kind of component was not being met. Um, even their physical, you know, needs were not being fully met. If we look at this picture on the slide, do you see any safety issues, safety concerns, right? Looking at the bars of the cribs, I'm just thinking of these babies and getting their heads stuck in the cribs. And these cribs were made of lead. And what did we say that babies go through? One of the first stages babies go through that Sigmund Freud talks about, it's the oral stage, which means these babies suck on they suck on their crib bars, they suck on everything, right? And so these babies were consuming lead, there were safety issues. And so what we found out is what we did was we followed the families that adopted babies from Romania. We followed them long-term and what we kind of found out was if the babies were adopted at six months of age or less, right? Anytime from infancy to six months, when they came to their new family, they pretty much developed a healthy sense of attachment. So they had secure attachment. This was a good thing, right? If the babies were adopted at a year or over, they didn't. For the majority of them, they just did not develop healthy attachment. They didn't bond with that adoptive parent or family. And then if they were adopted in the six months to a year range, it was kind of a 50-50 on whether or not the babies would form a secure attachment. And this is why we understand kind of how important the early years are in developing a healthy sense of attachment that allows the baby to feel safe and secure in the world. All right, social referencing just really means that we learn socially from looking at others. It's a reference point for entrance. For instance, in Australia, this is an Aboriginal boy. It's very normal for them to eat bugs. Here in the US, we don't see a lot of our kids chowing down on bugs at lunch. It would be against the norm to eat bugs, right? However, it would be with the norm to be 10 and have a cell phone, right? So social referencing, we learn. This slide is really uh, concerning and powerful. What it's talking about here is the health of us as parents and guardians is so important in how we bring up our babies or our children. So we're looking at the percentage of fathers that spank their one-year-old children. Now we'll talk about spanking in the future, whether or not it's you know something that we recommend or not. However, Again, dad's spanking their one-year-old, so 12-month-old babies, right? And what we see from the slide is that, let's say your baby spills juice, they hit their brother or sister, they do something that you deem to deserve a spanking. If dad is in a healthy emotional state, meaning he's not depressed, right? He's emotionally balanced. We see that, you know what, 12, 13% of dads will spank their one-year-old if they're in that healthy place. However, if dads are depressed, dad has lost his job, dad is going through financial struggles, whatever it be, dad's caregiving for baby because mom is working because dad lost his job, whatever the situation that's made dad depressed, we have, you know, like 40 or so percent of dads who will spank their 12 month old because the dad is depressed, not because the baby did anything different, Right, so the baby didn't do anything different. The baby did the same thing, the same infraction or whatever you deem to warrant a spanking. But if dad is depressed, he's much more likely to spank than if he's not more depressed. And one thing I tell you to really be careful of is dads do not understand their own strength. Right, men are very strong. They're stronger than women in general. And so if you ask me who in the home should deliver the spankings, I'm gonna say the female, because the female doesn't have the power that a male has 
And therefore, it makes a big difference on the amount of pressure and strength that we're applying when we spank our children. So again, being aware that as an adult, your health mentally, emotionally is important when we're raising our kids. Right? Again, what did Freud say? Freud says that the first couple stages that we go through as, as individuals, as babies, is number one, the oral stage. We talked about that. That we want to stick everything in our mouth. It's a normal developmental process. And that's why we typically give our babies pacifiers. Because we'd rather them suck on something that's been sanitized than having them pick up everything else and stick it into their mouth, right? And we want to let our children go through this process because if we don't, and when they get into adulthood, they develop these oral fixations of biting their nails, chewing on pencils, overeating, right? Um, and that's because they didn't go through this normal stage. The second stage that Freud talks about is what we call the anal stage. And the anal stage means that babies go through potty training. So remember, when you're a baby and you are going potty in your diapers and your pull-ups, when you start to actually be able to tell your guardian or caregiver, I want to go on the toilet, I want to go to the big boy potty, it's a big deal. And when you can start to do it without needing any pull-ups or any diapers, it's a huge achievement because you as a child have developed this kind of control over your body. And that's awesome. Right? So this is what Freud would say are the two stages that we go through. Now, Erickson, remember Eric Erickson and Sigmund Freud are the two different theorists we'll talk about when we talk about psychoanalytic theories. Erickson is right on target here because Erickson says the very first stage that you and I go through has to do with attachment. And it has to do with what we call the stage of trust versus mistrust. So as a baby, if your guardian or parent or, or mom, dad, grandma provided you with secure attachment, you have a bond with them, you learned to trust the world. You learned that if mom takes care of, she changes my diapers, she feeds me, she tells me she loves me, she plays with me, mom does all those things, I feel safe and secure in my home, I learned that the world is a great place. The world is a good place. However, if I don't get that, if my guardian or parent doesn't meet my physical needs, if they don't meet my emotional needs, heaven forbid they actually abuse me, all of those things that I learned, the person that was supposed to love me and take care of me didn't do that. Therefore, the world is a bad place. I can't trust the world. I can't trust that other people will take care of me. And so we learn mistrust. And so that's why as adults, when I talk to couples or I talk to people and one couple starts telling me about your boyfriend or your husband that wants separate checking accounts, you want to keep your money separate, there's a trust issue there. Or your boyfriend that's questioning, who's your coworkers? Why did you go have lunch with that guy? They don't trust you, even though you've given them no reason to distrust you. There's trust issues and those trust issues stem from here. And it's very difficult to have healthy relationships when there's trust issues, very difficult. So we'll talk about that. Erickson says the second stage you need to be aware of that we all go through is what he calls autonomy versus shame and doubt. So autonomy, the word autonomy means self-rule. So it means a toddler or a baby has self-rule or self-control over their body because they can go potty on the toilet, right? They've learned to go potty train and that's a big accomplishment. So they feel good about themselves. However, what if they don't do that, right? My son was four before he potty trained. And in general, girls are much faster than boys at verbally speaking and at potty training. Okay, that's just the way it is. But what about when you have a six-year-old who still wets the bed, which is very common for boys, right? My son was actually nine when he still had accidents. Right? So what happens when you have your eight-year-old who still has some bedwetting issues and they can't go to Jimmy's G.I. Joe sleepover party? Because if they go to Jimmy's G.I. Joe sleepover party, they might wet their sleeping bag. And how embarrassing in front of all of the other boys, so they just don't go. Right? So that leads to shame and doubt. Because it's like, oh, my other eight-year-old friends can potty train or they don't have bedwetting issues, but I do. 
right? And so that makes them feel bad about themselves. And overall, what we're going to learn from Erickson, and he's, he's right on target, what we've learned is true, is those issues or problems or things that happened in our childhood. So if you were abused, if you just had a guardian who told you you were good for nothing, if they talked to you and said they wished you'd never been born, if they said ugly stuff that we should never say, those kind of things, they do affect you as an adult. And we have to talk about how to overcome them. All right, behaviorism, right? So behaviorism is never one of the grand theories we talk about. And let's talk about Bandura, who talks about social learning theory. And he really says that we learn through observing the behavior of others. So he did this experiment. And what he did was he had an adult and he had the adult in a room and he gave the adult a mallet or like a hammer, right? And he had a big blow up clown kind of doll there. And what happened was the adult would take the mallet or the hammer and just hit the blow up doll. And so they made a video of the adult. Now there's no words going on in the video. So then he takes a four year old boy and he sits him down in a room and he shows him the video, but he doesn't say anything and there's no words in the video. So the boy is just watching the video and he's watching the adult take the mallet and hit this clown doll. Then he takes the same four-year-old boy and he puts him in a room and he gives him a mallet and he gives him this clown blow-up doll and he doesn't say anything. What do you think the little boy does? He copies or imitates exactly what he saw on the video. And that's what we're talking about with the social learning theory. That sometimes with social learning, there's no words needed. That's why you should always be careful of who are your children's role models, who are their friends, because they are learning socially by observing them. Right? And then as parents, we tend to fit into you know, one of these categories of what we call proximal parenting or distal parenting. So proximal parenting would be what I think of as much more hands-on parenting. So it means that physically we do a lot of touchy-feely with our babies, um, you know, frequent holding, frequent touching, you know, there's close proximity to our children. And then distal parents, not so much. So with distal parents, you know, they provide a lot more devices or mechanism or toys or things like that, but the actual physical contact is a little less frequent or, or you know, a little less intense. That barrier is more established in distal parenting. And you can see that culture probably plays a big role in this, right? I come from a Latino culture, right? We're very hands-on. I kiss on my aunts and uncles when I see them. And, you know, I love all my relatives and that's just the way we are. So we're very proximal. I'm very proximal in my parenting with my children, right? Doesn't mean that, that distal parenting is wrong because we still definitely need those words of affirmation. So even though maybe you don't hug your children all the time or things like that, you still need to be saying to them, you love them, that they're awesome, things like that. All right. Um, and again, just kind of read through, you know, some of the things here and make sure to go through your clickers and, and, and make sure that the information is sticking in your brain. And again, we talked about attachment and you can refer to this chapter slides when we go through our case study on attachment. We will see you then for chapter eight.